Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This being a show where it's about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Let the Right One In. Great episode. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. Well, first and foremost, let's start off with Claire, Matthew, and Peter. Now, I thought that was so interesting. Obviously, they've made a vampire of their own, which I guess... They're just kind of saying in this continuity that vampire, making another vampire is such an instinctual thing. I guess it's like, right, as long as you, well, I, I forgot if it's this series that explained it. That I think so. I think Claire had explained it to her brother that basically when you're basically biting a, a, into a victim, you're basically passing on the virus. So I guess as long as you don't fully kill them, then like the virus will take over and they'll become a vampire. So it is like a easier process. As long as you don't kill the victim, they will eventually leave them long enough and the virus because the virus comes into them just like it's just like a zombie bite. Like the virus spreads throughout your body type of situation. So I think they explained that in episode that'd be episode six. Obviously last episode was a flashback episode. So I'd have to say because it's, it's, it's been two weeks so I could be misremembering that. But I wanna say that's how Claire explained it, but do correct me if I'm wrong, but because I was about to say, like, how would Peter know how to do it and kind of do it successfully because he's never done it before? But it's like, as I not less is 100% instinctual, but it's also just if you know the science of it, it makes it a little probably easier to kind of do it. So they made this guy Chris, which I do love that representation. Once again, it's that neat parallel between. Mark and Claire. Both are willing to do whatever it takes. Just like Claire is only willing to do whatever it takes because obviously it's her brother, but obviously her father put her in a position to do whatever it takes. He, as a father, was willing to do whatever it takes to save Peter. And obviously that correlates with Mark, who is willing to do whatever it takes to save Eleanor. So there is this interesting parallel where it's like neither one of the people they're trying to save fully co-signs everything that they're doing. Eleanor has, like, issues with the way Mark handles things, which we'll talk about when we get to that side of the episode. But, like, the fact is, I think it's that scientist and as well as the doctor side of her being like, this is a, this is a, this isn't, this is a no, uh, no named person. Because if you know a person's name, then you see them as more than what they are. Because she needs to detach herself. Uh, that's the only reason why she's been able to do what she's been able to do is she has to go like, right, it's all for the sake of saving Peter. I'll do whatever I need to to do it. That means selling drugs that will eventually lead to people super and gruesomely murdering other people, you know. So there's that. But two, um, the fact that she can't like recognize it as Chris. She has to be like, you are a them, you're an it. Because I can't recognize you as a human being because it makes what I got to do that much harder, you know? Because I was thinking like the whole like him kind of stuttering throughout the episode. I was like, oh, I wonder is that a process, part of the vampire process? Is it just kind of readjusting? It's like, no, she's caught up his brain. So, of course, like some of his like probably like... Like, uh, some of the connective tissue, like, some of the neurons aren't firing there just because of this. So that's why his speech is a little impaired throughout the episode. It didn't click in my head to be like, oh, yeah, that's most likely why he's stuttering just because. And she even says later on, she's like, I'm not a brain surgeon. All the stuff I'm doing is trial and error. I've never done this before. So the damage I'm doing to his brain is irreversible. The only thing we can do at the end is kill him because it's about putting him, also, like, putting him out of his misery because he has nowhere to go. He doesn't know the, well, Peter tries to explain later on the process of, like, Right, you don't drink water. Uh, go to a dark place. Don't be out in the sunlight. No sunlight. But it's like, yeah, like he's he doesn't have time time to really like explain everything to him but also that's not the purpose of it you're supposed to help Peter get better you're supposed to be the means to which we can make a cure because the thing because once again they both see him differently because Peter sees for the first time he has someone to communicate with that I think that's an element to this that Claire is missing with um Peter is the first time he's been around someone who's like him, who can understand what he's going through. Because he even says, like, right, you're lucky you have me. Because he's like, I had to be the one to figure this all out on my own. He's like, right, your mouth is hurt. It's, like, it's the teeth. They're, they're coming in. He's like, right. But basically, it was like, hey, I get to be here to guide you through this. Like, it's even scary having no one there to explain things. I mean, luckily, Eleanor and them had Zeke, who watched enough horror movies to kind of... But even then, obviously, he based everything on horror movies. So he's like, great. Right, it's still like a slow-rolling process, right? Uh, even then he didn't have all the answers and he couldn't fully help her, which is every, like, yeah, he understood from movie perspectives, but in Peter's case, it's like, this guy, Chris knows exactly what I'm going through. But I think something else Claire didn't think about and, you know, probably doesn't 
you know, because we don't know what it, what whether it exists or not in this continuity is the sire bond. The, and most vampire lore will tell you the sire bond is an extremely, extremely powerful bond. There is no other bond, whether it's mother and child, brother and sister. I mean, it was just a sibling relationship, a parent-child relationship. There is uh, a significant other relationship. You know, there will never be any bond as strong as that. It's it's un un indescribable. So that's why he was like, "No, he's mine." And she's like, "You're not making any sense because she can't comprehend it. Because even because this is Peter's first time making someone. So I think even he didn't quite under comprehend. He's like, "I want to feed him. It's not just because like, hey, he's. It's a combination of I think one, he feels sorry for him. Two, it's like a hey, I have someone who's like me situation. Three, I think it is to sire bond because I don't think she because they don't have experience. The one who made Eleanor and Peter hasn't been around to showcase like, hey, the sire bond is a thing." Um, so she doesn't have anything scientifically to go off of in that regard. So I don't think for her, it quite comprehend. And like I said, I don't think Peter, it really sank into Peter's head, but, but for her, yeah, once again, it's like, once this is all said and done, I'm going to have to kill him. Uh, that's the only way. And I think in her what mind, it's like, yeah, that's also, you know, it's like you put down almost like a wounded animal, sadly. But uh, Peter, st oh, right, I, I, there was uh, some other interesting things. She did discover that the person who made Peter and Eleanor might be very, very old. Because she was saying, like, right, comparing and contrasting, like, Chris and uh, the stuff between Chris and uh, Peter. And then she looked into it. She's like, right, like, if you, there was something she was looking at that she was basically like, hey, if you look at this, it shows the thing, the creature that bit you is extremely old. So I was like, oh, fascinating. So it's not a youngling. Whatever made them is extremely, extremely, extremely old. Um, I must, once again, I do believe it was probably like a, at least with Eleanor's case, it was definitely a, hey, you got interrupted. So I'm assuming the same thing happened in Peter's case too. The re Cause it was also like, you probably did in a very public and enough neighborhood. I mean, at least in Peter's, well, if it was back at Peter's home, it's like, right, that's a very isolated place. So, and probably maybe Matthew might've been there at the time. So he probably made that a little harder, uh, for him to kind of get away with Peter. Same thing for Eleanor. Cause I, I don't think he just meant to turn him. I think the purpose was, oh, I'm going to feed on you but whatever the case may be it, it, it seems like even last episode kind of implies that what's the case and he was just interrupted um once again you think if you were that old you'd be more but it's like right society changing and you're kind of underestimating the living circumstances of the victims you're going after you know so i think like i said peter's circumstances of yes he's an isolated house but his father had matthew working for him so that probably made that a little bit harder whatever the case may be uh, we still don't know the full backstory in that on the, the on that flip side, their circumstances, their experience uh, with Peter's circumstances. I mean, to be fair, the only person who has that experience is probably because Matthew's probably been there since the beginning. The same thing for Arthur, but you know, and Peter, but Claire doesn't have that perspective. So yada yada yada, so on and so forth, right? But uh, the other thing I thought was so interesting is. Uh, Peter tried to like sneak uh, Chris out of there because, hey, man, you could hear him crying and whimpering in pain. He's like, you want to help him. You don't want to just send him to his death. It's like, right, here's your best chance. Yes, yes, you understand what your sister's doing. You understand it. Because he thought like, right, once I'm cured, you can cure him too. He's like, yeah, she could cure him to what they'll considering how much his brain will be sadly mincemeat after the fact. So there, there'd be no point in it. All you can do is ease his pain by killing him. Well, when it's all said and done, when he, Peter tries to let him go, Chris, uh, like, attacks him and goes after Claire. And I was like, ooh, terrible time for Matthew to be away from the house. But also, like, the, that, I do love that in that moment. It's like, yeah, it's very much like a horror scene. Especially, like, the moment she got against the wall, I was like, do not get against the wall. Do not get... Oh, I was like, oh, she's against the wall. I was like, all he's got to do is punch a hole. And, oh, and there we go. He punches a hole through the wall and starts strangling. I was scared the entire time. I was like, I mean, I was like, I don't know if he'll, like, they'll actually let him kill her off or not. Especially because the way he was grabbing her neck and the top of her head. I was like, is he about to snap her neck? Luckily, Peter stepped in, and I think that cuts deep where it's like, right, you felt bad for this guy, but it's also about protecting your sister, but you also made this guy, so it's like, I think it is, like, it's basically like Peter just had to put down his child in that moment, and I, I don't think it's going to be till later on when he gets to explain to Claire, like, the feeling of what he just did. And just like the fact is, what is he doing? He's like, he's got Chris and he's just like dragging his body. Doesn't say anything to his sister. Doesn't ask like, oh, are you okay? You know, it's just like he just grabs him and is silent. Now, well, you're hearing they're dragging and you heard like, 
uh, the squirt, the, like the sounds and stuff, the squishing sounds, but it's like, yeah, he's pure dragging Chris's body, and it's just like, yeah, it's over. And his eyes aren't reflective anymore, so I think, like, it's kind of signifying he's straight up dead. So, that was fascinating. So, we have that, which is also interesting, interesting because earlier in the episode, Matthew and Claire had a certain visitor from, uh, it's Naomi, but, like, uh, I say Naomi, but it's Naomi, but either way, um, her and her uh, partner, Ben, Wrote it like they were going. It didn't cross my mind. They were like, "Oh, we're going to Long Island." I was like, "Oh, what are you there for?" And then the moment Matthew's like, "You got to get up the stairs now," I was like, oh, "Naomi and them rode up." It's like, of course, because they found out maybe like what a couple episodes ago that her father's like appeals are like make up seventy five seventy percent of the constitution of this drug that's been leading to all these murders. So. And obviously, Claire's never seen that. Well, she's heard about it, but I don't know if she's actually. I don't because I know she keeps updated, so she's aware. Because that episode where we found out, obviously, that the two uh, storylines were happening at two different points in time, they were happening like months apart, like at least two months apart from each other, type of situation. I didn't uh, that she would get notifications about the murders. I don't know if she would read the articles or like notifications about them or whether it's just like she would actually look at the videos of it or whatever, but at very least she was aware of it. What uh, Naomi showed her a picture of one of the victims. And I'm like, I don't know if that's the first time she's ever visually seen. It. I mean, to be fair, she's seen Peter rip, you know, his victims, his food apart. So it's like not that outrageous to her. So even if she hadn't seen the victims, she's seen that type of handiwork before firsthand. So, and who knows, maybe that might even, um, you might even be desensitized to it at this point in time, just because it's like, yeah, I've seen a picture of it, but it's like, I've seen it firsthand. I've literally seen my brother do that to someone firsthand, you know? So, uh, but because Claire's trying to say, like, right, this had nothing to my father. It's like, oh, the, yeah, it's like you said you're estranged from your father, but you're living in town. Like, yeah, he left this to you, to his daughter who he was estranged with. And it's like, right. Naomi was like, nah, like, look at this. Because it's like, I, she's acting like nothing of this has to do with her. That's because she's trying everything. She, well, for one, she's trying not to get caught. So there's that type of thing for the criminal side of things. But also, like, seeing the byproduct of your handiwork, it's got to cut you deep being like, yes, but once again, still trying to justify it by being like, hey, this is all for my brother. I knew what I was getting into somewhat when I did all this but it's like yeah it's all for his sake so I don't care whatever I gotta do I just gotta make sure I don't get caught for it you know and Peter doesn't get discovered for what he is now um on the, now moving on to the other side of things where we're picking up immediately after uh, Mark had told the priest everything and the thing was like the priest kind of took in a shot he's like oh let's go get a drink I was like Jesus, he's like, oh, you don't believe me? He's like, no, it'd be easier if I didn't. I was like, oh, that's, I was like, does this priest have experience with vampires? But it's like, well, if you're a holy man and you believe in everything about religion and demons and Satan, it probably isn't that much of a stretch for you to believe like, right, his daughter's become this creature because maybe you, maybe the justification is she was attacked by a demonic creature and it left some stain on her soul and it did something to her, you know, because it's also like, I mean, because because it'd be easy to be like, yeah, you're so, but it's also like, I guess the calmness in which he's telling the story, but how distraught he is, it's like, right, you're not making this up. If, even if you were like, why would you? So that's why either that priest has had some experience, but I, I chalk it up to like a no. He's just looking at it from like a satanic, like or like Satan or, and demons perspective, because at least I think, you know. Because I think some people, I, I would, I, you'd assume, and you, you know, and I'd probably be wrong. You think most re like religious people in that regard would look at it from, I mean, in something in that case of looking at it, something demonic. So you might not know the ins and outs of it. You not might not recognize it as vampirism. I mean, it's popular popular enough that you'd be like, yeah, that's so total vampirism. But from a religious standpoint, you could justify it as being like, oh yeah, that's like that's uh that's something demonic. You know, whether like I said, whether it's like oh she's been possessed by something, or whether it's like something left to stay on her soul and turned her into this so it's like right you're not mad at you're asking for forgiveness uh you can't give it until you stop killing he's like well i'll do it after my daughter he's like no god doesn't work like that he's like well fuck god then and it's like he said that not me um but um but the fact is he was like you're 
you're not mad at God, you're mad at your wife. Because for him, it's like, yes, my daughter is a good person. My wife was a good person. What did they do deserve this? He's like, it, cause it, and the justification that sometimes will get thrown in your face is like, when terrible things happen, it's all part of God's plans. Like, no one wants to hear that. Like, some people, that's an easier pill to swallow, thinking and believing that. And it gives people comfort knowing, like, hey, this is all part of some plan. For some people, it's like, what? No, fuck that. Like, how is, how is killing anyone, like, letting my daughter become what she is, stripping her of her normal life, my wife killing herself just so our child could feed, me having to kill people just so our child can feed. Like, what, what, what kind of plan was that? And he's saying that basically Mark kind of letting go is, might be part of the actual plan for you to stop killing, stop trying. It's like, right, like, try to live a happy life, essentially, you know? I kind of throw all this aside. It's almost like, right, you're asking me to do what Zeke was asking us to do 10 years ago. And that was just kind of let Ellie die. And it's like, re I refuse to. Because um, it's also like, right, you are carrying this burden of that promise you made to your wife all those years ago. You're upholding that. And it's basically weathering your soul. And it's like, I want to save your soul at the end of the day. So that's all we got to it. The priest won't say anything because that is the whole point of confession. Like, it's just like with it's like with a therapist, unless you are at well, that's a complicated thing, because he clearly said like I will continue killing people, so the priest could say something, but as long only if someone asks him, because that's why I feel like I think because the same thing applies with a therapist, they can only tell the police something, and you know obviously like law and order and stuff like that to kind of skirt around that, like you know which is kind of like when you actually think about it, you're like oh it's kind of fucked up, nothing can be sacred, but you're supposed to get a court order and stuff like that, but they'll try wiggling around that. You know, that's the whole thing, right? But a therapist isn't supposed to tell, I doesn't have to legally say anything to anyone because what you, what you do and what you're thinking is one thing. But when you're actively being like, yes, I'm going to do this, I think then a therapist and then a priest can say something. I could be wrong. Once again, I'm not a religious person. I've never actually had, I've never had uh, taken confession before. Uh, not take, well, had, well, it's still called taking confession. I know your priest takes your confession, but I think it's taking confession. It's not having confession, right? Either way, I've never had, I've been never in a confession type of situation like that before. Uh, so that, uh, plus I'm not a therapist, so I've never been in a situation of like, oh, am I supposed to report my, my, my uh, patient saying some wild shit? You know, it's that whole thing, right? So I could be completely wrong about all that. So that's why I'm like, don't take me at my word. But on the other side of things, um, obviously, uh, I felt like Eleanor had snuck out, but she was out. And I was like, oh, are you, I, I thought, why didn't you just sneak back out? Because I'm like, yeah, Naomi's probably there. She's going to find you. But she was fine with it. And it's like, well, I'm going to have to talk to Isaiah. You're, you know, a young boy, you and girl sleeping in the same bed. It's like, I mean, sleeping over secretly without tearing either one of their parents. It's like, eh, that's, uh, I can't, can't, let, can't let that slide. We, one of us needs to, it, well, not one, just both of us, both of the parents need to know about what you're up to type of thing. But she was reading the note that uh, she had made for Isaiah, even like the whole um, the book and everything and being like, oh, I hope you appreciate it, which Eleanor, well, because she's like glad to know that someone appreciates it. And Eleanor's, yeah, because being in the circumstances she is having lost her mom, she is someone that's like, yeah, I recognize the hard work you put into it. And Isaiah, hopefully he does, too, because, you know, and because for Eleanor she finally broke down and like Naomi like comforted her because it's like right seeing and hearing that letter just probably was just a reminder of her mom being gone you know it, it's still just that much of a fresh wound so especially once again with us having the context of everything from last episode but uh yeah uh Naomi and Mark, you know, Mark's like, right, apologetic about things that kind of happen, but he's like, hey, I'd like to take you out to dinner. She's like, yeah, but, you know, Isaiah and uh, and Eleanor have a special thing. He's like, no, no, no. As parents, we can make the promise that they will always come first, and Eleanor's listening in. She's happy about it, because I was like, right, because her dad sacrificed so much for her. Like, he's he's been, like, consumed by all this for the past 10 years. She wanted him to be happy, because for the first time in forever, she's happy, too. And so, like, both Isaiah, I love Isaiah being like, right, if my, our parents get together, and like, not tomorrow, but, like, later on in the road, at some point in time, they get married, aren't we going to be brother and sister? And Eleanor's like, oh, make us family, which they're both kind of down for. It's like, yes, yeah, that complicated thing. It's like, yeah, it happened quite a bit in Riverdale, uh, because uh, at one point in time, FP and 
Alice Worth thing, which was complicated because at the time Jughead and Betty were dating. So it's like, I was like, how did it's just kind of a thing of like, yeah, it's always going to be there in the back of your mind, but eventually you're just kind of like, eh, it is what it is. So you just kind of accept it as is. So that's just kind of funny when other stuff kind of brings that up too. But uh, yeah, um, Mark admits he does like Naomi, but there will always be this asterisk and complication with it because it's like, hey, she's a cop, and it's like, oh, I could use her for information. He tried to justify that in front of um, Eleanor, but but he was all because he was also embarrassed to be like, oh yeah, I actually do like her, and because I kissed her not because I needed to, but because I wanted to. I got caught up in the moment, you know, the memories and stuff like that, but also. He, I think for him, it's that thing of, hey, like, I don't want you to think I'm going to replace her mom. But she's like, no, I, I don't think that, Dad. But you deserve to be happy. So they do go on a date and they are having fun. He avoided the subject of like, hey, he's like, he wanted to do what Eleanor wanted him to do. He's like, right, I'm just going to have fun. Let's talk about something else. Why don't you sing anymore? And because uh, and she's like, right, you have to kind of let go of child things and stuff like that. As she's pulled from Corinthian. And he's like, that is not with a voice like yours. That that's not. Uh, some child saying he's like oh that's not like a flirty line she's like I quoted something from the Corinthian night so like neither one of us is doing our thing and he's like oh man he's like I haven't dated in a long time she's whoa this is a date and I, just, I love it. it it's super cute and it was a fun moment until Naomi had a vent about her encounter with uh, had a vent about her encounter with um, with Claire earlier in the episode and that obviously struck a chord of Mark because he was almost like a Okay, I'm piecing stuff together. And, um... Because Eleanor is actually taking some defense classes from, um, with Naomi, which I'm also like... And from the very beginning, I was like, oh, that's probably not too good of an idea. It's like, well, you do have, like, the whole superhuman strength in your favor, and you don't want to end up hurting anyone you're sparring with. I mean, she did kind of elbow the dude because, like, Naomi was like, hey, like, you know, I want, when you're fighting, you need to fight for survival. You go for the eyes, you go for the balls. It's like, which uh, obviously is a vampire. She can really do some damage on, on either front. I mean, don't even need to go that far. She can rip off arms and probably, like, rip you to shreds type of shit, right? So... But uh, obviously being armed like this, you know, because, uh, yeah, she might have superhuman strength, but I think even as a, well, because we, we know that she's, like, been able to lift up her own dad, but in a fight, being legitimately trained, like, having strength is one thing, but that means nothing if you don't have the technique and skills to go along with it, because, like, yeah, like, as long, like, if someone's a more technical fighter than her, they can kind of get around her superhuman strength as long as they avoid her type of thing, so if she's able to kind of close the distance and do some, do some damage that way, like, close quarters type of shit, like, she has the advantage, so, um, but even when Naomi's, like, putting her hair in a bun, because it's like, right, let's get your hair out of the way, you can see the smile on her face, because she's happy, like, she probably hasn't, like, the last person she's had, like, someone might really do that with her is probably her mom, so to have Naomi do that, too, it's just almost like a, yeah, you you, you see me as family, she, she likes it, and so eventually, uh, well, uh, Matthew rolled up, and because he saw Isaiah leaving their apartment, and it's like, Whoa, he's like, oh, I heard about a leak up here. Oh, yeah, I work in a building. It's like, yeah, my mom's a cop. He's like, yeah, I didn't ask that. You know, it's like, oh, you're leaving the door unlocked. And But luckily, at that time, Mark came back and Matthew immediately bailed. But he was on the outside and he looked and recognized Mark. It's like, okay, so the cop that I'm investigating is also lives in the same building. I mean, because he doesn't know, like, the ins and outs of it. But it's like, right. Whether they, like, there's a connection between the cop that came to investigate us and Mark. And now he's probably thinking, like, oh, Mark is doing this because he's working with the cop or something like that. That might be, like, his stipulation. That might be what he's thinking. Either way, um, Mark did some research and he saw, Arthur, like, remembering, like, okay, it's like, okay, Long Island pharmacy person he looks it up and he sees a picture of arthur which i was like yep that's going to mean something to you because you specifically because he'll probably remember every lead he ran down when it came to uh eleanor i mean this was 10 years ago but it probably like really stuck out to him because he probably remembers because he was probably like wait why did i rec it's like right your son and he read up on it more and he looked at claire's face and he's like right and it's like they said there's a woman behind this operation was kind of what uh that was what um Isaiah's dad said, so now it's a situation, I'm like, well, okay, so now, 
So, and I remember seeing Claire that day and Peter and it's like, oh, Peter supposedly died. So I don't know if he knows that Peter's necessarily a vampire. And if that's the sad thing, like if he could get a picture of Peter and show it to Eleanor, she might not have as good as memory, but she might be, might be like, wait, did I meet this? Or even show uh, Peter Eleanor's picture and be like, well, I met her before. It's like, wait, you have? It's like, dude, the, the dots and connections are already there a little bit. Sadly, beforehand, like, when, as he, he brought up this information, like, yeah, like, I found out about all this stuff. She's excited. He's like, oh my God, you're closer to a cure. It's like, how'd you find it? Oh, uh, Naomi told me. It's like, wait, I thought you said you liked her. I did. He's like, but that doesn't matter. It's like, yes, it matters. It's like, the fact of the matter is, if I get cured, we can be a family. Like, she's like, they're the reason why I want to get cured. And he was like, once you're cured, we have to leave. We can never see them again. She's like, what? It's like, yeah, she's a homicide detective. It's like, she won't understand just like Isaiah was. It's like, no, if he knew what you are, he does know what I am. And the fact that she's like, I love him and he loves me. I don't know. If, I, I don't know. How, I legitimately don't know how to like interpret that love. It's like, is that just like you are like, is that puppy love like type of situation of like you are legitimately because like Isaiah likes her and she likes him too. But I just don't know if it's like a, oh, I like him or like I like him, like him or I like her, like her type of situation. Or is it like a love and a more like, no, we're so tight. We're, we're bonded. We've got this. Once again, it's kind of almost like that friendship, familial love. Or is it kind of an amalg amalgamation of like legitimate and like, oh, my God, I'm in love with this person. It's a familial love and a friendship love kind of all rolled into one. I mean, they probably can't really distinguish between it at such a young age, you know? And so for her, it's like, yeah, he knows what I am. He accepts me for what I am. It's like, Naomi would too. It's like, yeah, but you're also asking Naomi, who is smack dab in the middle of this, because uh, she also, once again, she doesn't know that one of the victims, one of the people he fed you, fed you which he's not going to tell you, was Isaiah's dad. Now, if you found out that information, it changed your tune a little bit, because it's like, right, and your dad doesn't want to do that because he knows how that would jeopardize your relationship with Isaiah. It's like, right, anytime you'd be around Isaiah, you'd be holding... Because she's like, he's, his his thing is like, you put Isaiah in a complicated position. Anytime he's around his mom, he will have to basically be lying to his mom forever because you want it to be honest. And so you're going to complicate their relationship because he's always going to have to lie to her to some extent. Yeah, it hasn't really had to come up yet, but eventually it would, you know? And you put him in such a compromising position. But once again, it's like she doesn't know that she ate, you know, drunk the blood from his dad because, hey, her dad killed his dad. So, but once again, he doesn't want to like, even though he was upset, he was like, you have no idea how many people I killed for you. Your mom died so you could live. He was just frustrated and angry, you know, because, you know. They both kind of want the same thing, but for Mark, it's like, there's just too much. There's too much blood on my hands. There's too much, too many bodies or connected to me for us to just be honky dory with Naomi. Yes, I like her. I know that you like her and Isaiah, but we can't make that happen because eventually the past will catch up with me because for the past 10 years, I've been doing nothing but killing people so you can have a meal because as we know, she needs a full human adult human a month so at bare minimum at bare minimum we're talking maybe 118 bodies or so now the reason why i'd say roughly 118 is because i am not counting um her mom nor the guy whose blood got wasted uh, as the the flashback stuff, so I don't count those. But that's roughly speaking, like yeah, he's got about like one body on his like. That's a that's a lot of people, bro. If he did that, because it's like right, she would need to eat one at least once a month. So just and she would need a full human course for that. So it's like that's a lot. Understand it because I've never done the math until just now. I was like, that's a shit. Yeah, because they once again, they gave us the math last episode of how much she would need in a single month. So it's like now it's like you put that in the past decade. It's like that's 120 bodies. Once again, not counting the two from the flashback because that's her mom. But also um, the one guy counts, but doesn't count. So let's make it 119, not counting her mom, but 119 doesn't technically count. One of them doesn't count because it's like, hey, the blood went away, so it's kind of, it kind of meant nothing. It was kind of for nothing. So that's where you kind of get into that territory of things. So understandable why he's frustrated, you know? 
And obviously having all that thrown in her face really bothered Eleanor a lot because it's like, man, it's just kind of no, like having her mom, like, yeah, my mom, mom died to save me. Like, like that guilt wasn't already there and just having her dad and just in his anger kind of throw that in her face like that. He didn't mean to, but he, you know, he leaves a message saying like, Eleanor, I would do anything for you. The fact of the matter is one day when you're older and you have your own children, then you'll kind of understand that instinct a parent has to do whatever it takes for their child. So for him, it's like, I, what I've done, I've done because I love you and I'm so proud of you and I will do it again as many times as it takes. Yes, it's wearing down on me. Yes, you know, but it's like, right. The end goal is I'm willing to do whatever. Once again, uh, Claire and Mark are two sides of the same coin. Uh, but he does roll up at uh, Claire's house just when this is all going down. So I'm um, going down at their house. So Matthew shows up because he was following them and knocks him out. So now if they have the opportunity to talk, dude, there's there's a lot to talk about. I doubt it's going if it goes down the conversations, it won't be until the end of the episode because Mark has no reason to like open up his cards about everything and neither does Claire in them. So who knows? Matthew might be the only one they interact with and stuff like that. So that's going to be a whole thing. So they need to talk. Whether they'll get to that actual point of like let's fully talk, we'll ultimately have to wait and see. But the other thing to it is like Isaiah, I do love the beautiful like flip on it where it's like, right. Where she was before there to hold Isaiah when he was thinking about his uh, dad. Now the inverse is Isaiah gets to be there when like obviously stuff about her mom comes up. And also knowing that, hey, if she does get cured, she can't stay by Isaiah's side or stay with Naomi. And it's like, right. Because it's not just Isaiah. Naomi's the first other person she's gotten close to. And like, you know, for her, it's like, right. Uh, we haven't been a family. Like, yeah, because like there's always been, sadly, this whole thing hanging over her and her dad. Like, yeah, they have a relationship, but it's still like it's been hard. You know, and I think maybe she thinks like, right, if, if we could have Naomi and Isaiah, you know, maybe we could we could feel like a family again instead of just like a, yeah, my my father who's trying to cure me. Like that's always been what's defined them for the past 10 years. So the the death and the blood that's just kind of been in their wake and just losing her mom the way she did, you know. It's, it's a lot and it put a strain on their relationship and I think for her it's like yeah this is the first time I get to be happy and my dad get to be happy we get to just be Ellie and Mark we get to be father and daughter without the stipulations of vampire or guardian or murderer or food supplier being held over Mark's head too so a lot of really really interesting things uh, to keep in mind as we go into the next episode I'm excited to see what happens next uh, but really, that's all I want to 